Hi everybody, I'm Giada Iacono Marciano and today I will speak about the role of magma degassing in mobility and metal enrichment of sulfide metals. In particular, I will speak about what Steve Barnes likes to call droplets, that are droplets of sulfide melt attached to a gas bubble. In reality, a magmatic temperature and pressures in the bubble we don't have gas, but supercritical fluids. Here you have the image that Mangal and Kotors used in 2015 to describe for the first time the compound drops or drobbles. Since then, drobbles are becoming very popular due to their important physical and chemical implications we will talk about. You all know the natural drobbles observed in Norisk ores that you see here. More recently, they have been described in several other contexts. But the advantage of experimental studies compared to the studies of natural samples is that the sulfide melt can be observed before crystallization and its association with the fluid phase better characterized. So I will use two types of experiments at magmatic pressures and temperature to illustrate the consequences of drobbles for both mobility and metal enrichment of the sulfide melt. The top image illustrates interaction experiments between magma and coal that were designed to study how coal assimilation by magma may favor the production of sulfide accumulation at no risk. The bottom image shows decompression experiments of volatile and sulfide saturated magmas that were desi designed sorry, to investigate the effect of magma degassing on the behavior of the sulfide melt. Although the mechanisms triggering the gassing are markedly different, as well as the composition of the free phase and the oxygen fugacity, in both cases, micro CT renderings shows, show a strong association between the sulfide melts and the free phase. Here you see the 3D distribution of both sulfide droplets and bubbles into different samples. For the rest of the talk, the free phase of interaction experiment is visualized in red whereas that of the compressed experiment will be in clear blue. The first physical implication of drobbles, identified by Mangal and co-authors, is that they can transport the sulfide melt upward in a magma. If the total density of the compound drops is lower than that of the silicate melt, of course. But when the fluid bearing magma is sulfide rich, every bubble can carry several droplets of sulfide melt as we see in this micro CT image of a decompressed sample of ours. And this favors the coalescence of the sulfide droplets attached to the same bubble because their interfacial, interfacial tension is lowered by the presence of the bubble. Here is a cartoon of what may happen when two droplets meet in a crystal pore magma. If the two droplets have different densities, during rising they can coalesce increasing both the bubble and the droplet size. In this micro CT rendering of an oriented experimental sample, we see indeed that the larger bubbles and sulfide droplets are in the upper part of the sample. We also see that the number of sulfide droplets per each droplet increases toward the top of the capsule. In crystal-rich magmas, like those of our interaction experiments, drobble rising is lower, slower due to the presence of crystals. We observe that both bubbles and sulfide droplets are deformed by the presence of crystals, but also in this case, as for crystal pore magmas, we observe coalescence. Here you see on the left the shape of one of the largest sulfide beds that clearly indicate multiple coalescence. So, in both decompression and interaction experiments, droplets represent a very efficient way to create sulfide accumulations. This is a particularly important implication of droplets because Robertson and co authors show that during magma flow, droplet breakup is the dominant mechanism rather than coalescence. Chemical implication of droplets depends on the affinity of sulfur for the free phase. Mangal and Kowotor show that sulfur is drawn into the free phase and the sulfide melt consumed with a decrease of pressure. 
uh, with the decrease of pressure, also the sulfur content and sulfide saturation increases, and sulfur can be partially redissolved into the silicate melt, contributing to sulfide consumption. We propose the disconsumption of the sulfide melt by degassing as implication for the metal enrichment of the sulfide melt, as metals are preferentially partitioned into the sulfide melt. Although a part of the metals is transferred to the free phase and the part is redissolved into the silicate melt, most of the metals are concentrated in the sulfide melt and therefore the higher the consumption of the sulfide melt the higher is metal enrichment. Here we see nickel and copper contents of the sulfide droplets of an experimental sample that was not decompressed in red and of one that was decompressed in green and that experienced a partial degassing. Each data point in the diagram is a single sulfide droplet and you see the droplets of the decompressed sample may have higher nickel and copper contents. You also see that the effect of sulfur degassing and sulfide consumption is equivalent to that of increasing R factor. The blue line shows indeed how nickel and copper contents in sulfide vary with increasing R factors. In this case, the increase in nickel and copper is limited because sulfur degassing was limited but a larger degassing may lead to higher nickel and copper contents. You see here the effect of moving from 10 to 1% sulfur melt in this system means moving from about 1% nickel, 1% copper to more than 6% nickel and 8% copper. This corresponds to an increase in the air factor from 10 to 100, but higher factors can be reached if sulfide consumption is even more extensive. For larger degassing, we observe a total consumption of sulfide melt in the experimental samples, leading to the formation of PGMs in the silicate melt. We see here in this decompressed sample sulfide melt inclusion in olivine crystals, mainly consisting in FES, that indicate the occurrence of a sulfide melt before decompression. Whereas in the silicate melt, or at the silicate melt olivine interface, we only observe PTS nuggets. Iron, nickel and copper are redistributed between the silicate melt and the fluid phase, most likely depending on the composition of the fluid phase. Nickel and copper possibly prefer the fluid phase, whereas iron preferentially incorporate the silicate melt and can eventually boost penal crystallization, chromite or magnetite, depending on the availability of chromium. So, let's summarize the physical and chemical implication of droplets. Droplets may favor the upward transfer of sulfide melt, the coalescence of sulfide droplets, the consumption and the metal enrichment of the sulfide melt, and probably also PGM formation. The sulfur and free phase content of the magma and its degree of crystallization control whether each of these processes occurs. If we think in terms of intensity of the gassing, low degassing may favor the coalescence of the sulfide droplets, whereas high degassing could favor both droplet coalescence and sulfide consumption. Finally, extreme degassing can lead to PGM formation, even if the magma is initially sulfur-rich and the sulfide melt, nickel and copper-rich. We can therefore say that the amount of sulfide melt decreases with increasing degassing, whereas its metal enrichment increases. Of course, when the consumption of the sulfide melt is complete, no more metal enrichment is possible in the sulfide melt, but platinum group minerals may crystallize. We can now apply this concept to Norisk Tana cores, where the mechanism producing the fluid phase is likely to be the interaction of the magma with the vaporitic and the organic matter rich rocks, coal in the case of Norisk 1 and Talnak intrusions 
and argillites in Karolak intrusion. I stress the carbonaceous rocks that are always forgotten because they are critical to reduce the oxidized sulfur of evaporites into a sulfide melt, but also critical to release an abundant free phase of which Norris Tarnak intrusions present extremely abundant evidence. This interaction experiment in particular is probably the one that best reproduces sulfide and fluid generating mechanism under risk. In the same sample, we observe nice droplets on the right and nice sulfide accumulations on the left. Three main types of ores are observed in Norris Tarnak intrusions. Massive sulfides at the lower contact of the intrusion, disseminated or globular sulfides in the lower part of the intrusion, and low sulfide PGE ores in the upper part of the intrusion. These three ore types may be respectively interpreted as heavy droplets that sank, accumulating at the base of the intrusion, the massive sulfides, or floating troubles frozen in place in the all living rich rocks, the globular sulfides, or in the case of low sulfide ores, extensively degassed rubbles that may have consumed most of the sulfide melt, favoring iron dissolution back into the silicate melt and chromite crystallization around the bubbles. Our distribution is therefore in agreement with the gassing, increasing from the bottom toward the top of the intrusions, implying sulfide melt consumption and metal enrichment also increasing toward the top of the intrusion. I'm not saying the degassing is the only mechanism accounting for metal enrichment of Norris Tarnak ores, but it may significantly contribute to it. Thank you for listening.